Jaguar versus Taipan. Cassowary versus Anaconda. Giant spiders versus poisonous frogs. Crocodiles versus caimans. Experts anticipate the continents will rejoin once again in the future, setting the stage for an epic showdown between animals from Australia and the Amazon. The clash between these two unique ecosystems is going to be legendary. The question remains, which side will emerge victorious? So what's with the unification of the continents? It'd be nice to get a heads up about such a big event. Don't worry, we've got plenty of time. According to Professor Chris Gotezi, this merging is set to happen over the next 250 million years. That might sound like forever, and it's actually a long time even for animals and plants. By the time Australia edges up to South America, most of the animals and plants we know today will probably be gone. Well, at least in the form we're used to seeing them. However, Australian animals can get to the foreign continent even today, without waiting for the lithospheric plates to move. Actually, this could work out well for them. Picture a different Australia. Massive forest fires happening nearly every year, temperatures soaring to around 122 degrees Fahrenheit in Sydney and Melbourne on a regular basis, storms and floods reshaping coastlines, precious ecosystems suffering, and the iconic Great Barrier Reef simply vanishing. All of this is a result of scientific projections about Australia's future with global warming, spelling doom for its wildlife. The vast distances of about 4,300 miles to Asia, roughly 4,000 miles to Antarctica, and approximately 9,300 miles to South America further complicate the survival of endangered animals, especially those on land. They simply can't cover these distances. And yet, they'll still have a chance to move to a new habitat. They can be moved by humans, either on purpose or by accident, just as rabbits and camels once ended up in Australia. There are thousands of invasive species recorded around the world today, so it's very easy to envision a scenario where people are trying to save Australia's animals dying from the heat. When it comes to marine animals and birds, they actually have a good shot at managing things on their own, if they choose to, that is. Take crocodiles, for instance. They hitch rides on sea currents for long journeys, getting carried along for hundreds of miles. Now let's consider the potential risk posed by newly arrived animals for those that have lived in the continent for a while. Personally, my initial concern was about spiders. In Australia, they often end up eating things that aren't exactly their typical prey. For instance, they might eat tiny possums, which aren't usually a part of a spider's diet. But not in Australia. An Australian man from Tasmania captured a rare moment when a huntsman spider tried to gobble up a tiny possum. The spider expert explained that this is quite rare because usually such spiders eat small birds, frogs, and geckos. The tiny pygmy possum, in contrast, weighs about a quarter of an ounce with a head and body length ranging from 2 to 2.6 inches. That's definitely larger than both a frog and a gecko. And for a spider, every additional portion of food is crucial because, unsurprisingly, the prey isn't exactly thrilled about becoming someone's dinner. In 2016, a rather extraordinary video emerged. A notably large and strong spider was effortlessly hauling a big mouse along the outer wall of a refrigerator. The spider firmly gripped the mouse with its shell cirae as it climbed up the fridge. Of course, this happened in Australia. Once again, experts mentioned that this was the first instance of such behavior they'd come across. Typically, these spiders tend to prey on snakes or birds. These two events happened at the same place and are incredibly rare. Looks like in Australia, spiders decided to be mean and switched up their regular diet. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now take a look at this photo. A tarantula the size of a dinner plate was hunting a young possum in the Amazon rainforest, and this terrifying rare encounter was caught on camera. Australian spiders taking on unusually large prey demonstrates a remarkable blend of fierceness, aggressiveness, and veracity. They might even give Amazonian spiders a run for their money. However, there's a twist in the story that carries both good and not-so-good implications. These spiders you see in the photos, which are known as huntsman spiders, are already established and doing well in regions of South America. Picture the scenario where Australian spiders mingle with the spiders in South America. What kind of prey might these spiders go after? But all that's nothing compared to crocodiles. Here it is, an animal that can truly thrive in the waters of the Amazon. Caimans, arapaimas, pikes, river dolphins, even otters 
All of these animals have not yet seen such a large and deadly predator. And something tells us that the crocodile will get to the very top of the food chain. Remember that introducing new predators could potentially wreak havoc on the ecosystem. Many experts also think that one of the major reasons for animals dying out is when predators end up in a closed-off environment. This is because the balance of who eats whom is quite delicate. This was shown through an experiment where researchers looked at three lizard species, two were prey and one was a predator. The two prey species managed to coexist without problems, one stayed up in the trees while the other preferred the lower ground. But things changed when a predator was introduced. The lower ground lizards had to move up to increase their chances of survival. This shift led to competition for food, which ultimately harmed both species. That's a straightforward example that shows exactly how a new predator's arrival can shake things up. When the prey doesn't have enough room and food and they're always at risk of getting eaten, it ends up causing whole species to die out. It might seem sad, but it's just the harsh reality of nature. Australia's relocation package wouldn't be complete without the Tasmanian devils. They have the ability to tackle prey the size of a small kangaroo, but they lean towards opportunistic eating, often scavenging for carrion rather than actively pursuing live prey. However, when there's an excess of available food, these creatures might switch to fresher meat. Who'd want to miss out on that? Although the Tasmanian devil prefers wombats, it's equally happy to eat all small local mammals such as wallabies, bitongs, and potaroos, as well as domestic mammals including sheep and rabbits. The Tasmanian devils don't mind birds of any kind, they'll even eat a penguin if given the chance. If the Tasmanian devil ends up in South America, it'll find sloths to be the easiest prey. Occasionally, these slow-moving creatures have to come down to the ground where they become even clumsier. Unfortunately for sloths, the Tasmanian devil is the formidable predator they can't escape from. Adding to the issue, Tasmanian devils are very voracious creatures that can devour just about anything and then multiply like crazy. A couple of decades in the Amazon will be enough for them to become an invasive species. Remember the story about how Tasmanian devils nearly wiped out an entire population of penguins? They can do the same thing in the Amazon. They'll kill and eat just about anything until they simply run out of prey. It's true that there are predators in South America that can hold their own against Tasmanian devils, yet some jaguars might ignore them as they're pretty small and not worth the trouble to hunt. And relying on snakes, caimans, and eagles alone wouldn't likely stop the invasion. What about the dingo? Red kangaroos, swamp wallabies, cattle, dusky rats, possums, magpie geese, seals, fish, penguins? Dingoes have a varied diet too. Dingoes are excellent hunters who can track down almost any kind of animal. On the flip side, the Amazon is home to numerous voracious animals as well. Still, dingoes possess a crucial advantage. They can form packs. If we look at the predators in the Amazon forest, it's apparent that they mostly thrive in solitude. The exception is otters, which do live in groups, but they stick to water. So Amazon animals are simply not accustomed to such predatory neighbors. They'll need time to adapt. And while they're adapting, populations can be so severely affected that there's simply no turning back. Just as a hungry pack of hyenas might overpower a lion, a pack of dingoes might even try to take on a jaguar. What about the anaconda? Yeah, it is indeed a fearsome predator, but it can only constrict a single animal at a time. Meanwhile, the other dingoes could easily overpower it. Currently, there aren't any creatures in the Amazon that can take on a fully grown large anaconda. However, once the dingoes arrive, this will change. Don't forget the Taipans. They too will probably want to move to a more comfortable environment. The Taipan is considered the most venomous snake in the world. In 1950, one of the first people in history to catch this snake died from its venom the next day. In addition, the Taipan can be extremely aggressive if cornered. Moreover, unlike numerous other venomous snakes, the Taipan lacks the usual bright coloring or any recognizable traits that might signal other animals to keep their distance. Animals in the Amazon may see the taipan as easy prey, but it's unlikely that any animal on the continent can survive its bite. We can assume that it's going to be a lose-lose for everyone. The taipans will die from wounds and the attackers will die from venom. No one's going to benefit from that. In the wild of their native Australia, taipans have virtually no natural predators. And potential prey knows better than to mess with this snake. In the Amazon, animals will need time to pick up new things, and this unfortunately results in a lot of deaths. A truly massive number. To make it clear, here's a fact. 
Just one Taipan bite can bring to an end 100 humans or 250,000 mice. So everyone's at risk, including jaguars and anacondas. On the flip side, newly born and young taipans have a bunch of natural enemies like various birds of prey and monitor lizards. This might be a bit of an issue for taipans because there are quite a few predators in South America. Still, it doesn't seem like a big problem to me. More like a minor obstacle. And then we have cassowaries. These are unique Australian birds that I would describe as a bit of a paradox. On one hand, they prefer avoiding conflicts whenever possible. Some scientists even mention that studying cassowaries is tricky because they tend to run away before people can even get close to them. But on the other hand, a single cassowary is not only capable of protecting itself, but it can also launch an attack. Potentially causing serious harm. Cassowaries are quite territorial. They defend not just themselves, but also their food sources and chicks. Their natural predators include crocodiles, pythons, and dingoes. This means that predators from the Amazon like jaguars, anacondas, and even river otters could also consider them prey. Cassowaries are the type of animals that won't go down without a fight. There's evidence of a dog getting fatally injured from a cassowary's kick. It's not a stretch to imagine a situation where a cassowary unintentionally disembowels an anaconda while defending itself. This could have consequences for other native species too. The cassowary is definitely seen as a risky target for predators, and it's uncertain whether the bird can handle the pressure from local predators. However, no creature in the Amazon would simply give up its home and food without a fight. Let's take jaguars for starters. They have a huge advantage. They prefer to hunt at night from ambush, plus they can see well in the dark. What happens if they cross paths with, say, dingoes? They also tend to hunt during the night, increasing the chance of a run-in with these big cats. Dingoes have pretty good night vision, although not on par with the big cats, mainly because they're more reliant on their sense of smell due to their dog-like nature. As a result, a solitary dingo could become an easy target for a jaguar. This large cat can suddenly pounce on a dingo, whether it's from an ambush on the ground or leaping down from a tree, and the dingo can do nothing about that though a group of dingoes could pose a challenge for jaguars. Still, dingoes are known to hunt both individually and in packs, suggesting that a jaguar might be able to select appropriate prey if given a little more time. The key point here is that dingoes aren't tree climbers, or at least they're not as skilled at it as jaguars. This means jaguars can still hunt their prey the same way as before, by hauling it up a tree so that dingoes can't get to it. Tasmanian devils, as I said before, are too small to pose any threat or interest to a jaguar. The big cats can ignore them altogether. However, Australian crocodiles could be a new food source for jaguars. They're known for their ability to hunt caimans. Of course, crocodiles are larger, but jaguars can prey on young crocs and simply avoid the larger ones. What's a crocodile going to do? Climb a tree to get to the jaguar? I don't think so. Cassowaries, emus, and kangaroos are undoubtedly formidable creatures, but they wouldn't pose much of a challenge for a jaguar. If a jaguar decides to chase them, its speed, agility, and night vision give it a significant advantage. Speaking of night vision, this ability is a handy trait in most situations, so even with the arrival of these Australian monsters, the jaguar's way of life won't be disrupted. As for food, the jaguar won't likely face any shortages. Australia's diverse animal population can easily provide enough prey to keep the jaguar well-fed. Here's something that might intrigue anyone with knowledge about South American animals. What do you think would happen if a saltwater crocodile was introduced into the Amazon waters where the caimans rule supreme? Adult male crocodiles can grow up to 20 feet in length and weigh between 2,200 and 3,300 pounds. On the other hand, the largest of caiman species, known as the yacare, typically reaches around 8 to 10 feet in length and weighs anywhere from 13 to 88 pounds. Clearly, there's a noticeable difference in size between the two, leading us to the conclusion that caimans are outmatched. Crocs are known to chow down on smaller crocs. They'd probably see caimans like smaller versions of themselves. Good enough for a snack. Caimans don't really have a good shot at fighting back against crocs, they might try to hide, but since both caimans and crocs like the same kind of places, that plan's not likely to work out. Unfortunately, caimans are doomed. Once crocs figure out they're an easy snack, they'll keep eating them up until there are none left. And then, naturally, crocs will just take over the vacated niche. 
The Amazon is also home to the electric eel, the apex predator in its habitat. And that's no surprise. These fish can use electricity for both attack and defense. You got the bottom of the net? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, damn, I felt it, I felt it. Oh, yes, he's there, he's right over there. He's right over there. None of the native species dare attack electric eels. The introduction of Australian animals to the Amazon isn't expected to bring about any significant changes. Tasmanian devils won't go into the water. They have enough to eat on land. Dingoes will also prefer easier prey on land. Only Australian crocodiles can pose a potential danger, however. A few years ago, eyewitnesses captured unique footage of a caiman biting an electric eel and then dying from the discharge. That is, the electricity the eel generates is strong enough to kill even such an animal. While in this video the eel was eventually killed by the caiman's jaws, encounters like this can serve as a wake-up call for all other animals. Yes, the Australian crocodile is way bigger than a caiman, but that doesn't matter. The electricity will either kill it or discourage it from hunting eels for life. In general, you shouldn't expect crocodiles to be a threat to electric eels. The eels are the bosses around here. Don't forget about piranhas. Contrary to many myths and spooky tales, piranhas actually have a diet primarily made up of fish and plants. They are not active hunters, so they're fine with eating only dead animals. In order for piranhas to show any interest in something as food, that something has to already be dead, so they won't attack first, under no circumstances. That said, caimans have been known to feed on piranhas. However, crocodiles probably won't waste energy catching these fish because the prey is too small. They prefer to focus on someone more nutritious. Only small, young crocodiles may pose a threat to piranhas, but in general, predatory fish are hardly threatened. Worst case scenario, the piranha population slightly shrinks as a result of bringing in Australian animals. When it comes to formidable predators, the green anaconda easily outshines any of Australia's native monsters. This is primarily because these anacondas have an appetite for just about anything they can get a hold of. From tapirs, deer, and capybaras to jaguars and caimans, the anaconda is happy to devour any of these larger animals. What does Australia have to offer? Tasmanian devils, dingoes, cassowaries? None of these creatures pose a threat to the green anaconda, unless, of course, the anaconda decides to have a taste of them. That's a scenario we've covered already. Even venomous snakes and spiders, which are found in abundance in the Amazon, pose no threat to anacondas due to the significant difference in size. They basically ignore each other and go about their own business. The Amazon's teeming with venomous creatures, yet anacondas manage to thrive. The Amazon generally has an unexpectedly large number of apex predators, and the giant otter is one of them. But unlike all the other animals we've listed today, the giant otter is an aggressive territorial animal that doesn't like outsiders. Living in large groups, otters become even more formidable. What's more, they have a natural habit to protect themselves from threats by teaming up. There have been cases where otters have even attacked humans. A group of giant otters is deadly enough to take down a caiman or a small anaconda. Therefore, most Australian animals will not be a threat to giant otters, only the crocodile may cause problems. It's larger than a caiman, so it'll be more difficult to deal with. But giant otters are smart enough to start forming larger groups. Perhaps if there are really a lot of them, it'll be possible to take down even a crocodile. In any case, these animals are unlikely to give up without a fight. They can defend their territory to the last otter. Plus, otters are awfully vocal, fast, and agile. In the end, both Steve and I believe that the crocodiles might give it a shot with otters a few times, but then they'll likely figure out that it's just too much effort. Why bother spending energy and time hunting them when there are plenty of other easier meals available? Tropical forests are also home to many different species of poisonous frogs, but most importantly, it's home to one of the most poisonous vertebrates on our planet, the golden poison frog. Normally, if an animal comes into contact with a frog, it might get poisoned by eating it. However, with the golden poison frog, even a brief touch can be lethal. What's even more astonishing is that a single two-inch frog holds enough poison to kill 10 grown men. In simple terms, any living being should definitely keep a safe distance from this frog. Thankfully, nature has gifted the golden poison frog with vibrant colors, which other local species see as a warning. Although when it comes to the new animals from Australia, things are a bit different. 
There might be some unfortunate incidents where an animal attempts to eat this frog, and they'll definitely regret it pretty quickly. You know dingoes, crocodiles, Tasmanian devils? They're fascinating and everything, but Australia's got way more going on in terms of biodiversity. Steve and I were kind of thinking, what about those critters that don't belong there, like invasive species? The ones that managed to sneak into Australia or are already hanging around? Could they actually make themselves at home in a new spot? For example, the cane toad. We've mentioned it multiple times already. Crocodiles, monitor lizards, birds, they're all dying because of it. But you don't need to be concerned about the cane toad itself as it originally came to Australia from South America. Cane toads were quite comfortable here before, so for them, it's like coming back to their hometown after attending college. Everyone knows you, and no one is going to eat you. The European rabbit is a slightly different story. It used to be a major challenge in Australia, like a final boss in a video game. But can it cause trouble in South America too? Yes. The European rabbit is already an invasive species there too. For instance, it's causing real issues in Chile and Argentina, where it was brought in about 150 years ago. However, its modern habitat is just below the Amazon. This raises a question. If rabbits are so good at multiplying and taking over new areas, why haven't they spread across the whole continent in the past 150 years? Why are they just sticking to the outskirts? Because the Amazon is simply hard for rabbits to handle. There are hundreds of predators in the rainforest, and they don't allow rabbits to spread and reproduce beyond control. Also, the Amazon is pretty hot and humid, a combo that rabbits can survive in, but it's not exactly their favorite. Wildcats, another devastating species for Australia, are already present in South America, and since they're still not a problem, it means the living conditions are not favorable for them. Things get interesting when it comes to foxes. If we were to introduce Australian foxes to the Amazon, there's a good chance they could settle in there. We can see this from the example of the hoary fox, a species that already lives and thrives in South America, so it's quite possible for Australian foxes to adjust and figure out how to survive there despite the various risks. The only issue is that these new foxes might end up endangering the hoary foxes. You know, the usual problems, competing for food, fighting over territory, and they might even start mating with the local foxes, which could impact the purity of their bloodline. Wild boars are already present in many parts of South America, located to the south of the Amazon River. If they were introduced to regions farther north, they might pose a risk to the existing population of feral pigs known as picaris in that area. But jaguars and anacondas will definitely be happy to have a neighbor like that. The last invasive species causing trouble in Australia is camels. They were initially brought to the continent as animals for riding, but were eventually let loose. The chances of them accidentally ending up in South America are incredibly slim. Even if we were to imagine such a scenario, it's doubtful that camels could survive in this new environment. They found Australia comfortable mainly because the climate there is similar to the hot, dry conditions of North Africa and Central East. In simple terms, camels felt at home in Australia due to the similar climate. On the contrary, the climate in the Amazon is humid and filled with many unfamiliar plants, trees, and water sources. This combination makes it the least camel-friendly place possible. But native species are not the only challenge Australian animals may face in South America. To adapt to their new environment, they'll first have to overcome some obstacles. For example, darkness. In the heart of the primary rainforest, the forest floor is rarely the thick, tangled jungle we see in movies. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Down below, you won't find much vegetation due to the dim lighting. This scarce light is a result of a canopy about 100 feet high. This canopy not only blocks out the sunlight, but also provides excellent protection from rain and wind. It's so effective that if you're visiting the rainforest, you might not even realize immediately if the weather changed for the worse. These pictures might resemble twilight, but nope, this is actually what a day looks like in the thick Amazon forest. So animals that are built for only daytime action are automatically put in a tough spot. Yet for many of Australia's monsters, this won't be an issue. Cassowaries are essentially dinosaur-like birds and inhabit similar forests in Australia, so they're already adapted to this environment. Tasmanian devils do their hunting exclusively at night. 
Dingoes have great night vision, and crocodiles generally don't live in dense forests. As for all those venomous snakes and spiders, they don't rely on eyesight to find food. In a way, Australia's creatures are surprisingly well-equipped for the Amazon forest. One of the major distinctions between the Amazon and Australia lies in the levels of water and humidity. Typically, the Amazon receives rainfall ranging from 79 to 394 inches throughout the year. Conversely, Australia had an average annual rainfall of merely 23 inches in 2022. The difference is truly enormous. And for some animals, this can become critical. Tasmanian devils, for instance, choose to breed in dry caves, hollow logs, and burrows, often co-opting the burrows of wombats. Yes, those same wombats that Tasmanian devils eat. They really like warm and dry spots, something quite scarce in the Amazon. Dingoes also set up their dens in rabbit holes, caves, or hollow logs. They too need that dry environment. And it's not just the wet ground that's the issue. Each year, more than 96,000 square miles of Amazonian floodplain forests get submerged by water overflowing from rivers. This phenomenon creates the most extensive system of flooded forests on Earth. The landscape is changing dramatically, but it's also vital to the effective functioning of the Amazon basin area. Floodplain forests represent between 3 and 4 percent of the basin area. On this map, the places that are never flooded are highlighted in black. And if you think there are a lot of these places, take a closer look. The whole area is covered with rivers, streams, various bodies of water, and everything around them is regularly flooded, which means that animals that live in burrows won't be able to live there. Yet, setting aside this point, Australian animals can easily rival their Amazonian counterparts. Consider dingoes, cassowaries, and Tasmanian devils. They all display excellent swimming abilities and show no fear of water whatsoever. And yes, crocodiles would really love it there. Yet there's another factor that's like a wild card. Animals sharing the same territories for hundreds or even thousands of years encounter numerous diseases and then build up resistance to them. So let's say an Australian crocodile catches a disease from a caiman, which might be as insignificant for the caiman as a mild cold is for humans. However, since the crocodile doesn't have that immunity, it wouldn't survive. The Virginia white-tailed deer illustrates this point well. It carries several diseases that don't harm the deer itself, but can be deadly for larger species. As a result, animals like moose and elk are almost extinct in areas where Virginia white-tailed deer live. A similar situation might occur for animals in Australia or even for native species in the Amazon. It all depends on whose infection turns out to be more potent. Now, let's imagine a scenario where all the animals we've discussed today somehow ended up in the Amazon rainforest, and not in some distant future, but very soon. The clash of species is becoming an immediate concern. Can we find a way to resolve this conflict before it even happens? Come up with some solution? Maybe use something like the fences they put up in Australia? Don't forget, we're dealing with the Amazon rainforest here, which brings certain challenges. The dense jungle is so tough to navigate that certain parts remain unexplored even today. We're not sure about the exact numbers and species of animals hiding in there. Picture this, a hot, humid environment, difficult for construction and any other equipment to traverse. Also, in some spots, the local trees can grow as tall as 100 to 200 feet, with the tallest one reaching a staggering 290 feet. Just thinking about how tricky and costly it'd be to erect fences in such conditions is scary. Just to give you an idea, these are the fences you'd find in Australia. And they do their job just fine. But notice the landscape. It's pretty barren with very few trees. Now, how would something similar appear in a place like this, for instance? And even if fences were built, imagine how difficult it would be to repair and maintain them. Not to mention that fences are never good for animals in general. The way regular fences are put together can accidentally hurt them, or worse. Fences can also prevent animals from finding food and water and even separate babies from their parents. And large barriers in general can impede migration and even disrupt ecosystems. So fences are definitely not a solution to the problem. All that remains to ponder are the outcomes. Asian carp were introduced to the U.S. with the aim of clearing pipes, but now they've turned into an invasive species, putting the nation's rivers and lakes at risk. 
Cane toads were imported to Australia to eliminate bugs on sugar plantations, yet these toads have spiraled out of control, causing harm to native animals who get poisoned. Foxes and rabbits were brought to Australia for entertainment, but now they cause millions of dollars in damages annually. These are just a couple of cases among many others. Whenever people relocate a wild animal from one area to another, even if they mean well, the results are hard to predict. You'd have to be Dr. Strange to look at every possible scenario, and maybe one of them will be favorable. So moving animals to a new area, even if it saves the population, is not solving the problem. It's creating a whole bunch of new problems, and it's almost guaranteed to harm local species. All in all, humans are certainly not going to make things any better than they already are. Nature figured out how to spread animals across the planet a long time ago, giving each one its own special niche. However, it may also consider other options. See you later.